Mark Hathaway. Mario Marquitas. George Stewart. Thank you. We'd like to welcome the airport board and uh, excuse Steve Gleason, airport manager, as well as Lonnie Woodward, who's an airport board member who are attending to, who, uh, Steve apparently is attending to family matters. As Lonnie is attending to family matters after the death of his daughter last week. We mm -hmm. send our condolences to this family. Uh, the opening prayer will be offered by Stephanie Detson, our council chair. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful day and we're grateful for the time that we have to come together and discuss um, more ways that we can help the city and we're grateful for, for the many people here in the community and for um, all the programs and, and things that we have to help better the city and please bless us to be able to uh, work together and, and to strive to lift the city and we're so grateful for all we've been blessed with and we say these things in the name of thy son jesus christ amen, amen. so first up on the agenda we have an update on the process for updating the airport master plan and this is to be presented by Trent johnson airport operations you want to go up there, um, right there. whatever you're more uh, yeah. all right the terminal layout plan portion of the master plan is about 90 percent done and we meet with rsh next week or next week we're currently receiving calls on the environmental assessment for the terminal and this may be a city cost of the fa uh, discretion discretionary The Duncan Aviation is moving ahead with their campus. Currently we're surcharging the area. Uh, they're going to be breaking the ground probably. Well, I'll let, I'll let Bill. Okay. I, I did bring a uh, hand out here just for some information on it for the city council. <laughs> the uh, we have come down to final, final statistics for the facility reporting on that fine tuning over the last couple of years, and uh, the final count is the facility will be 280,000 square feet. Uh, when we started this process in 2007, it's going to be 120, so we're here a little bit. Through there, so. The uh, initial projection was a $30 million uh, facility around 72 months. So it's going to be much larger than we anticipated. This will be the first phase, uh, probably long after I'm retired, there'll be a second phase of about the same size uh, added out there. We did finish preloading, as Trent uh, mentioned, we finished our preloading under the building pads in April. Rain finally quit, the snow finally quit, enough for us to get out there and slosh through the mud and get that done but uh, we are right now internally we're on an accelerated schedule uh, that dirt has to set for six months where we did get approval from the geotech engineers to not wait until that's finished to start our deep piling footings so we're planning on starting those footings in august and uh, probably about october 1st about the time the dirt is finished settling those pilings should be in place and then we can go ahead and do footing this fall trying to get those two pieces in place before winter sets in and then we can do it otherwise if the winter comes in early we don't get those footings in we'll probably report not three months for be delayed in those two straight months so that's kind of the the nickel update on the site um, we did receive our air permit, we have that in hand, we're still fine tuning the uh, land lease and uh, agreeing with the city and agreeing with the state on a couple other points, so a good part of the time. Great. All right. Can I ask a question? But I know that we're, I guess it's, we have some responsibility with that with the public works as far as the sewer and the water. I don't know how we have it. Our commitments are on those that we're coming along and where we need to be, but I don't see we'll, we'll have to get with public works, I guess, to get 
get that answered appropriately. Yeah, David's doing it this, this year. I know uh, is, they were going to put in the lift station, the sewer. West uh, Guard's already finished their uh, substation for the gas. Yeah, the substation has been for us. The, I, I don't know the current status from the public works standpoint, but I know the public works, city engineering, have been having uh, meetings that I've been attending all last summer and fall with our architects. So I know that they're in sync on the time and what is going to happen when we have the whole project through. So the whole of the details are, but I know that we're talking and we're in agreement. So. And then we've got a federal project uh, to rebuild taxiway alpha. Uh, the bids have been out on three constructions to start to do. And that's that would be a great project to have done. Um, new corporate taxi lane with UBU parking lot will be construction begin this. Do you know any more about that, Chris or Mario? Uh, the UVU parking lot. The UVU parking lot right now, we're um, uh, choosing an uh, engineering firm through uh, DFCM in the state of Utah. Um, the preliminary meetings have been held to be able to get preliminary bids to ensure that the, the appropriate amount of funding can be allocated for the project. Um, in addition to that, uh, conversations have been had and have been started with uh, engineering uh, with Provo City to ensure that uh, we figure out what kind of uh, public work connections we need to do when it comes to sewer, electrical, and uh, moving any potential or uh, watching out for any potential infrastructure that already exists in the area in question. It also coincides with the master plan to, to the point that uh, the confines of the parking lot that would service these buildings would obviously meet the existing and the future master plan allocated areas for that part of the lot. So those, uh, there should be no no, no change to, to anything in that regard as far as the needs are concerned. We're shooting for about 150 to 180 stalls um, that would that be able to service uh, the Utah Valley campus uh, for the airport and the aviation science program that we have to have that location. Uh, as far as uh, the, the next phase of that will be uh, soil samples uh, to ensure that we find out uh, what the soil is looking like and that will help us also establish the rest of the financing that's required. We are anticipating to build a temporary lot um, on some of the available space that would uh, allow us to park and continue to remain in business while this other structure is constructed. And we will do that in conjunction with the coordination with the airport management and of course uh, Chris Whitehead and uh, TAC Air based on the fact that they would like to have this construction going on at the same time close to that area. Have anything to add uh, yeah, as far as uh, in conjunction with that project, um, we'll, uh, Tech Air, we've uh, for a few years now we've uh, had a demand for increased uh, capacity at the uh, airport as far as being able to handle transient aircraft and uh, base customer aircraft. Uh, we've got lots of businesses in Provo that uh, would like a place to store an airplane instead of taking their business elsewhere, which a lot of them already have. Um, but uh, so it's been a few years in the makings. Uh, we've come to uh, agreement in principle with uh, uh, airport manager. Uh, and right now we're just finalizing some more, a uh, little bit more details with that. Uh, engineering for the building is pretty much complete, but uh, uh, engineering for the uh, a location and uh, kind of the same situation that the Mario with UVU is in uh, still need to be completed. Uh, soil samples still need to be taken. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, that's kind of where we're at, and uh, and uh, hopefully we will get started on that project here shortly. And Trent, I wonder, I don't know that everybody in the room understands why have a need to build a parking lot, maybe we should spend just a moment to clarify that. For you? Yeah, for us. Um, and, yeah, is, and I'll be brief, but uh, essentially because of the, uh, the master plan development, all the infrastructure that's happening at the Portland Municipal Airport, it's all positive, but it does uh, put a taxiway potentially right through our parking lot. 
So that's the reason we would be looking to, to build another one is that we will lose the existing parking lot for the construction uh, of that taxi night. And the taxi way that, and we at Tech Air has, like I said, agreed in principle with the, uh, to build half of the taxiway as per the master plan. Uh, we'll, we'll be constructing about 400 feet of that taxiway. Uh, it will be contingent on another party to build the other half of the taxiway. And we have submitted mitigation plan for historic key hangers to be knocked down and uh, rebuild the hangers. Uh, the, current, the current terminal building is at capacity. The region would like to expand service to 10 more additional locations, but our terminal is just bursting at the seams with what we've found. And there's really not a lot of good ways to add on. Um, How many flags are in the uh, well, like today, average? Oh, two a day. Two a day. Two to day. Two three a day. And the two destinations they told you they want to do them two times a week. But the, they'd like to have two aircraft there at the same time. And we got 180 seats and about 156 passengers. There's no room for two flights at the same time. Hey, that's another story on top of it. Well, their construction experts come out a couple weeks ago. Up would be all right. So the north wouldn't be good, to the south wouldn't be good. And we're just. Yeah. The current facility was never intended to be able to support a second story, so that would not be an option. Uh, you have to build out. You have to build out from the current structure. Um, that's only part of the problem. Now the other problem is uh, ramp space. Uh, we got uh, several operations there: uh, Duncan Aviation, Universal Helicopters, uh, Stack Air. Um, it's a small space for a lot of operations. Uh, to be able to fit another carrier, you know, A319, A320 size aircraft on there uh, would be very, I mean, you start worrying about safety concerns and things like that. So. You, you said that we can't build to the south. That's right adjacent right. to the south. But right. we are planning, there is a yeah. tentative situation to the south. Yeah, for a terminal, like, should be. I mean, it, for security, for it's in the wrong place. I mean, you have corporate pilots walking through, and with the TSA, you can't have that. I mean, we're just in the wrong spot all the way around. I might like mention as well that um, as the largest school and uh, you know single operator, even though we have the smaller planes, we obviously have a large large traffic count. Uh, we've already had some some pretty significant uh, issues that could have been certainly worse. From the standpoint of congestion, meaning that as these aircraft push back, they actually effectively stop, block all movement, not only for uh, support vehicles that have to move through the uh, that, that particular ramp area because it really funnels down. It's a very narrow lane. I would say it's only 40 feet wide or so from um, the edge of the taxiway, the non movement area, to the secure area. It might be 50 feet, but it's no more than that. And so it's a very narrow uh, area that people can pass through. When an A318 and A there, the, or uh, you know uh, any of the other aircraft that are there, push back and uh, spool up. Whereas we have other uh, corporate aircraft coming in and out of there, it effectively stops that. But it also at times stops all the the transient traffic that has to go on those taxi lanes up to the approach end or the departure end of an airport uh, runway. So what that does is it allows for or uh, really uh, when we talk about the propensity of being able to have uh, any kind of an accident, I think the mitigation of that is to make sure that we actually deconflict some of those congested areas. And um, by operating at the airport, uh, we can certainly attest to the fact that we've had several pretty close calls where people just don't know what to do when they might taxi or drive behind a pushback airplane um, because of how tight quarters everything's operating under. that makes sense. Is our master plan reflecting these challenges that we're facing, and it, and it's it, it's addressing those appropriately? Yeah. You know? I wouldn't be too far away from that. Separate. It's where it should be. Yeah. I think that 
the new terminal of the south end, even if there was unlimited funding, and we said today to go to the new terminal to go to accommodate this, that's two or three years out. Yeah, so it's we're kind of handcuffed right now for a while. Nope. Why two or three years? I know that we built this last terminal in 90 <laughs> days. <Yeah. laughs> so why are you saying two or three years? Is it just the financing or is it study for the land can be a year? There's no ramp. You can no ramp. Speed it up. Ramp, that's you. You can speed it up and then be say six months. The tax the tax load started to do no the tax load has been redone this summer as you know before it's born that ramp and so that's gotta be done this year. And then, I mean, the whole half the mold's got to be piped. There's a lot of work. So there's a lot more work than just than we had before when we build a terminal. Oh, yeah. 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 But that, 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 that's not, I mean, then you say the funding's not a factor. The fact of the matter is, is funding's a huge factor. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and Allegiant. Uh, like them or hate them, uh, they're a big driver of this. I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, like like Train Express, they've already uh, they want to announce two more cities starting next summer. So we've got to make changes to our current facility to do so. They would like to add an additional ten more or test out ten more additional destinations on top of the current destinations, increasing the and increasing the frequency to the destinations we already travel to. Um, so if you figure all that in, there's a potential for uh, uh, additional 20 to 30 flights a week. Right now we're at 14 flights a week. But and that's just a legion. And that's just a legion error. Uh, the financing comes in. Is just, uh, and I wish Steve was here, and I don't want to talk for Steve Gleason. Um, but we got to prove a, a revenue stream. Um, and so we're going to have to... I think what it's going to come down down to is we're going to have to operate, increase operations in the in the, in the facility we're at. Uh, to be able to do that. Is that to get the funding, the the, the grants and things? We have to prove matching funds. Is that what it's for? Or less? Uh, or I don't want just... to. Yeah, I don't want to speculate on that. Let's see. You look at Salt Lake. They're they're doing that fifty billion dollar project. Salt Lake from the parking had thirteen billion of it saved up. The rest are doing the uh, FAs give them and uh, said so. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit of money. Short short term, there really I think mean, two key issues are there's got to be more room for terminal to accommodate the pension you can. Yeah. And about the only place they can go is out into the ramp space, which is already tied or used to the fence the parking lot with a building structure. And we still have to be able to get two A320s in there at a time and maintain the rest of the operations on the Yes, yeah, so if you go ramp space, throw it two hurdles. And there are a couple options out there that we're exploring. So. Yeah. As we talk about financing, can I look at the budget? You may, I don't know if you can have the ability to, to look at this, but we have the grants for the largest number of grants that we've ever had. They had $8.7 million proposed in grants are those secure with, with federal are those federal grants or I, i'm not sure what would okay we'll have to follow up with steve on that just to see if that's because i see it in the budget and i wonder if it has to do with the rent the with the the tax the, the, the taxi lane and those type of things that yeah we've got those we feel confident that we're going to get them or with some of the things that are going on in the budget right now, with back I just wonder if we're running. Um, eight point seven million in the in grants. Well, we, we know that the taxi lane, however, is funded. Is it, is it not? They're still working on the taxi lane's funded. We're still working on the lighting. So the lighting, lighting yeah, the lighting, like anybody flies in there, so they need to. But these are kind of expected things that we plan on getting. That's why they're in the budget. Yeah, this is the FAA budget. Is that the one? We're yes. Yeah. The well, I'm at the Purple City budget. That's what I'm looking at. We have now, we're expecting 8.7 in grants. Now the city's got to put in the ramp for dumping. Right. And we had the bid opening two weeks ago. Sunrock got the bid. 
I, I believe, Trent, we're, we're also coming up to a threshold. Steve was talking about just recently. I think it's at 100,000 employments, 100,000 yeah. passengers a year. You get into a whole new level of funding from the ABA. Right. right. So we're kind of at that sort of pregnant stage now where we need to get more people in the planes. Going That's right. We're going to do it. And we're going to get show it. So we can do it. That's exactly right. We have to say, the rent is how much did you say? That's seven million. Yeah, you know, if we got that the capital improvement, uh, where are we at with our? Is that seven million. How much do we have in our capital improvement fund for that? It's in a separate capital improvement fund. We're putting all the Duncan's expenses in one place, okay. so we can track them. So there's a separate capital improvement fund beyond the airport. That okay? That's because I was looking at. Thank you. And we're still. Uh, Negotiate mitigations with the Provo River Federation for the birds. Uh, we'd like to make it a small, well, we'd like to not even be there, but as small as we can. Uh, you get a lot of bird traffic right across the approach end of our major run. It's just good. Let's just keep showing the movie slowly over and over again. Yeah, <laughs> Showing bird strikes. Or Although you've done a great job because we have not had bird strikes for a while as far as the yeah, we have uh, we have continual bird strikes, but they're usually smaller birds, starlings and the like. And we uh, you know we send that off uh, the material to federal regulators to, to look at that. But the real issue is that uh, these types of areas could actually bring in larger waterfowl uh, and pelicans and the like that um, would be you know doing their roosting and. And uh, those can do significantly more damage, so that's that's the risk. And that's about all I got. Good, good, thank you. Do you guys have any questions? We mentioned that in the very beginning of the presentation, the news. Or an environmental study that the, the funding wasn't there, the city might have to take it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that was on the land. I was just wondering how much that was. If, if that, you know, the city has to take it out before we're talking. The environment is for the terminal. I am not, I wish I knew, I do not. Um, Steve, please. Steve, please. Steve, please. And I wish you were there. I know the phase one environmental work is all finished on our side, so that may be talking about which new terminal sites. And that's what it is. Fine. That's that'll take a year. See if they got funding faster for a current. I'm sure they can speed it up a little bit. And how much does our general plan include land that is not Provo cities at this point? Did we've got plans? Yeah, are you just planning the general plan for a property that Provo City has or is it that, that we actually own right now? Would your general plan change if you had additional? Uh, I don't think the terminal side would. It, it, it's it's really probably the best spot. It's away from everything. If you go in there, you're in trouble. If you're not supposed to be, um, and there, it, it would be the best place, security-wise, and uh, all the way. But as far as other hangars or anything else? Is there anything else that you think might change? Should we need more land? Should we have own if we were owning more land? Um, no, I, I mean, the piece of property we talked about, right? That'd be a good piece to expand, <coughs> Duncan. Um, 
Oh, yeah. I was going to mention the, I think it's 3800 West is the road that will come in by Duncan. Mm -hmm. uh, that right now curves off to the east end of that property we were talking about. I think that just discussion from my memory, I believe that was long term plan to curve on around or rejoin center at some point for other businesses. And I do know Pat Whitney is uh, interested in something out the western U.S. and uh, the governor's office in the state are working with them on um, possibly locating an engine overhaul facility in the western U.S. and trying to promote Utah. So land down there might work great like that. The one we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it would be uh, my part beneficial. They right, when was talking about putting a shop with an art new facility. They talked to I think Chris about the hangar that we're in right now, but I'm thinking they are realizing they need more space than any of that. What they would want to do. And a lot of the aircraft we work on are draft powered, so it'd be a nice fit for us as well. Yeah, you can stop. So is that that's the one more for a bringing in business but the operation of the airport itself seems to be adequate but we're looking to expand for other businesses yeah what i'm hearing okay. Okay. so when you talk about expanding for other businesses i think that's really important because there's probably about a variety of issues we talk about our low income people can't afford housing and part of that is it's still not enough good things jobs. Yeah, and Duncan, how many do you plan on bringing in in the next? Phase one will be about 425. And they're good jobs. And I imagine this other company would be somewhat the same. Well, if you crack here for overhaul facility, it's probably 100 ish, something like that. That'd be good paying jobs. Well, like you said, Mill and Drive Synergies, um, I think other businesses will come in to that one side if they want to, mm -hmm. and even to support those. And having a craft engine facility on the airport here with the bird issue at the north end might be an extra fit. Believe it So, this next agenda item was an update regarding the status of funding mediation. We yeah, we covered that. Covered that. Really excited about all that. By the way, yeah. the fruition of many, many years of work was getting close at hand here. Um, the next item was an update regarding on-site development. We, I think, we discussed that. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a little extra time here for any additional questions or discussion. A question, I'm not sure how to phrase it because I don't know all the aviation terms, but I just know that when some flights can't take off because of visibility issues, some of the um, either private or commercial flights because of visibility, um, they have to go to Salt Lake and fly out. Is there a way to have that kind of technology at our airport or is that just so far beyond our capacity uh, we can to be able to fly out without the... There's so many... Just, yeah, there's so many things that we need before that that that's quite a quite a ways down the list. Yes. They've got what they call rabbits and uh, we used to have it. What's that? We used to have it. What is it? Yeah, there was a rabbit system at one time, but uh, when they did the uh, runway extension. But what you're talking about might be more like a cat two approach. I mean, basically, it's a semi-automated uh, approach. That's that's pretty expensive for a smaller airport. I'm not sure if you know anything more uh, or heard anything about that. But we're, we're full ILS today, aren't we? Yeah, we have the ILS and everything else. It's really just. Yeah. Is it 200 and a half? Yeah. Standard. Standard. Now, what's ironic is we still get. Quite a few diversions from so, so it's uh, for different reasons. Typically, it's wind, wind shear related. We got a number just like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we had eight, 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 eight diversions: one southwest, one skywest, and three delta. Okay. And they all land thirsty. Very thirsty. So, does uh, diversion 
generate income for the airport? Um, yeah, it generates income in the way of uh, fuel fuel flowage fees paid to the airport by TAC Air. Uh, what, what you're what you're talking about likely is the inversion weeks that we that we experienced late uh, January and February. Just to give you an idea, we lost two thirds of our flying in those two months just due to low ceilings. But we have different minimums, so a lot of other aircrafts can still do the instrument departures. And so for us, uh, in the PFR flight rules, the digital flight rules that we operate under, it's a little bit more uh, problematic. But uh, typically, your instrument flying now that we have the tower and the radar, the BI six, that's really allowing. I would say the majority of flights to still come in and out at that level. Uh, what you'll find, and Trent can maybe speak to the new snow removal equipment, but the braking action and the snow removal quickly enough has, I think, contributed to some of what you might be referring to as well. I, I was in Los Angeles flying out, and they seem to have it as bad or worse than we've got it here. The smog yeah. conversion. Yeah. Is, is that is the smog coming off the ocean? I mean, I sat there. Days, what twice and so yeah, we have a currently we have flights to LA and uh, almost recently we've had they've always they always have traffic delay or uh, what do they call them ground hold yeah ground hold delays uh, they don't let traffic in or out uh, due to the due to the weather you raise a great point though there's a big distinction between your operation of training and educating pilots where I just experienced people playing aircraft. And the single, single biggest contributor to being able to, to bring these airlines in and the commercial traffic, uh, corporate traffic that Bill works with, really was the radar and the tower, of course, as well. But that radar allowed uh, for, for sort of separation and uh, the knowledge on board the other aircraft of where those transit flights are, and of course, the training flights. And so, right now, there's a new uh, push for ADSP, which is a new type of system where we are all going to be empowered with the type of information from these smaller airplanes. And, uh, and that's really a big push that, uh, that we're all uh, getting on board right now. And it's also a mandate for the entire country by 2020. And also address your issue. Uh, there, were, we did, and I, uh, I don't want to assume anything, but we did have a high profile <coughs> event with the BYU charter last year uh, that was not able to, I can't remember if it was able to land or take off from the airport, but they had to uh, bus the BYU, BYU to uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, but that was not necessarily a fault of the airport, it was the equipment on the aircraft itself that was uh, not functioning properly, which was didn't allow that to happen. And that was, I know that was pretty high profile. And we're getting uh, down to ice cream. Room for snow removal it should be delivered this month. And we've been using the loader with a broom, and it's made a world of difference. And really has. Plus, the new aggregate on the new runway, since it was yeah. resurfaced, is uh, a lot less conducive to the ice buildup. Um, so it was a really coarse runway, which was great for wicking water, not so great because it also held ice um, when. One of those conditions. So I think the combination there, Trent, should be a good pointer. Yeah, we didn't have to close down at all this year. Therefore, other than this And this should be a great piece of equipment to help that out. That ADSB system you referred to, we've got two of those in the hangar right now that we're doing first time here in the world on a Challenger 300 and Challenger 600. So they're starting to get now at, at the service center level. Yeah, let's get those systems installed. We have a goal to be uh, ADSB compliant by the end of 2018, so two years ahead. And, and the reason for that is that it's not the mandate that drives, it's really the safety, what it provides. Um, imagine everybody having essentially radar on board. Uh, that's essentially what it is. It's just not as good as radar from the standpoint that if you have it on, you won't be able to see anybody, but it's the mandate is that you always have the signal it sends out. So it's essentially a radio frequency of sorts that's sent out by all aircraft. That's the mandate. And the operators like us, and of course all corporate airplanes, would be able to have a receiver where they can have in and out. So they would be able to see everybody else operating around them. And it'll dram dramatically increase the safety as far as incursions, in-flight incursions. 
and the risk that uh, comes with that. So we're right now the control tower is doing that, but well, we in have the future uh, it'll be the planes that will actually be communicating. Correct. So the tower has a BI six radar which operates on, on the same principle, tenant, meaning that it's a you, you have something called a transponder that essentially it does what it sounds like. It sends out a signal from each airplane that BI six will. Basically, it's not a it's not a radar per se that actually sees any kind of reflection from a metal object or a large object, but it will actually see that signal, and then the tower helps with separation. But we do operate still with some visual flight rules outside of that environment in this area, unless you're coming in on an instrument flight. But the problem has always been that the radar from Salt Lake can only see down to 8,000, 8,500 feet because of the point of the mountain. So the BI six allowed us now to be able to have this. Um, ability for these aircraft to see each other below that, and that's, that's been just a phenomenal, like, you know, huge, huge impact on us. The ADS-B will now be the same type of system, but what happens is that every aircraft will be sending and receiving those signals as opposed to having to funnel it through the, the radar, and that will uh, that will greatly increase uh, the information that pilots will have for, for avoiding other aircraft. So where that's a mandate, is that something that they're, the federal if it is planning to help fund through grants or that type of thing, or is it just everyone on their own? They just well, they'll, they'll have huge expenses on funding the ground stations. The, the, there's basically radar, uh, radio receivers and transmitters on the ground, too. There's, there's a big infrastructure. But then uh, aircraft manufacturers have to start building their airplanes with this technology, and then all operators will be required to have one form of it, which is actually not very expensive. It's about $1,000, and that's to have the transmitting transponder that will transmit the signal. Um, and then for between three to six thousand dollars in the type of aircraft that we operate, you can then have both, where you get the signal in as well. And then now that everything's going to a computerized glass cockpit, we can actually see our position and that of the aircraft around us on a digital moving map right in front of us. It's phenomenal as far as the type of uh, avionics and the uh, really the advance that has been made in just really the last decade, 15 years. In fact, some of our airplanes have as much, if not more, ability to. Uh, to showcase some of that information in some of the airlines because they, you know, they're, they're in production cycles for such a long period of time. But you'll see that uh, that's going to be catching up in, in a feverish pace. I know everything that Bill works on has uh, has those things as well, of course. But uh, it's 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 a pretty neat step for uh, aviation community. <coughs> so I've never seen a six thousand dollar solution for it. No, not for you, <laughs> but for us, for the yeah, just the transponder, right? It's good. Um, with regard to our tower. I know that we there was some concerns a year or so ago, but it, with all the things that you've used doing and our and our situation with the Legion, we seem to have enough employments now. Is that right? Is that an issue? The tower an issue anymore? With the uh, budget? Not until they make it. Not until they make it an issue. Huh? At this point, you and you haven't heard anything. No, I haven't heard anything. It was a, it was a twofold. So the employments is one, but the operations is the big one. So your operations to take off or a landing. That's the number we have to keep. Um, they count and, everyone. And is that a hundred thousand? Uh, yeah. Well, we were we we're there, and they they wanted more than a hundred, and of course we've been twice that at one time, and it's starting to creep back up again with our flying um, increasing forty percent over the last two years. That's really going to help that, and of course all the corporate and, and all these other flights we speak of. And with that in mind, I know that have you increased also your uh, operations out at Spanish Board? Uh, that are we yeah are we safe enough to are we doing what we need to do in Provo to make sure that we're getting those operations? So yeah, it's it's a good point, and, and what you bring up essentially is that, uh, and and a lot of people don't maybe realize this, but it makes perfect sense once you take a moment to think about it, and that is that all FA funding is based on uh, operations at all the airports. Uh, there has been some discussion of, of basing it on how many aircraft are actually based at the airport, but that hasn't happened yet to my knowledge at, at all. But what it is is in operations. But if you look at an operator like us that will fly over to, you know, close to 16,000 hours a year, uh, then what we do is we obviously take off and land two or three times an hour with these airplanes at Provo, but we also fly elsewhere, meaning that we're doing all the operations in Delta, Eureka, Ridgefield, uh, St. George Ranch Junction, certain Spanish Fork, and other places. And so we're actually helping the operational count throughout the state with our many flights, training flights to all these little places. So even though we may account for, well, it's over 50% anyway of the, of the operations of Provo for Utah Valley University, there's an argument to be said that we're actually 50% or even more than that at some of these other outlying airports because, of course, that's what we fly to. 
so if you look at Delta, for example, that only has a, a very small handful of airplanes that are based there, all the flying largely is from flight schools like ours that go there on training flights. And of course, that helps them get funding to maintain the airport. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the ironic twist. And it's really great because, of course, the FAA supports that as well as they do. So we, we, we fly in a very uh, great environment because these airports are, of course, maintained by those operations. So when we talk about uh, bird strikes, uh, are we worried or have we seen anything nationally on uh, drones? Big problems. Drones, uh, we went to a thing uh, in the tower that we were chatting a few years. We haven't seen anything. We get calls, the tower gets calls. We try to keep them 100 feet down. Because this whole valley, you really couldn't fly. It's five miles. I mean, you couldn't even fly up the foothills. And the height is a big thing. We just don't keep it down 100 feet. Yeah. And then the tower, they talk to them. And it hasn't been an issue so far. I might add that the new UAS uh, regulations allow all, all these manufacturers to actually uh, program these drones to uh, have a service ceiling of 400 feet above ground. And that uh, makes it so they can't fly higher than that unless they're fiddled with. And of course, people are making modelers are making them on their own. And there's uh, something called FPV, which is happening where they actually have a seven, eight, nine mile range where you can fly them just with goggles around your living room. And so that's the that's the really the dangers. And there's privacy issues. There's all kinds of other things. You can't fly them currently in national parks. You can't fly them over, for example, uh, Timpanogos. You can't fly them up there at all. You can't fly them within uh, four or five miles of any airport environment without uh, pre coordinating that. So there's a lot of regulation. But the FAA has just really been a little bit behind the curve as far as how fast they've been implemented and how easy they really are to to buy and fly. And if you've flown a drone, uh, my seven year old can fly as well as I can. So I mean, it's really not hard, and of course, there's it's, it's kind of the gift of the seasons these days. So it's definitely something we have to stay aware of. And the re the real difference between I'll be brief, but the real difference between RC flying and drone flying is just that's the technology. RC planes have always been within visual range. It's a lot closer than you might think. But you can't see them anymore, so it's never really been an issue. But these drones, because they can hover, because they can pro be programmed, and if they lose contact or if you do make a mistake. Push a button, it comes home on its own. It'll be autonomous. If it runs out of battery, it comes home on its own. You now have people pushing the envelope of what they can do. They push them out as far as they can to try it, and that's where you may have uh, an issue. Luckily, they're not very large in mass, and so uh, you know you could probably liken a strike to to um, a, a large bird in some cases. Um, but I think that unfortunately, what, what's going to drive this conversation is an incident or two. Um, and so, it, unfortunately, it's probably just a matter of time before we have something happen. And uh, what I can say about that is if you go from Green River, or excuse me, uh, Cedar City to Provo, you'll now see build billboards that say, you know, forest fires, keep your drones away, you know, kind of thing, because they have those types of issues. People flying around fires, the firefighters see that and they'll stop their firefighting work until they're dealt with. And so that's a perfect example. Of a government agency taking a stand and really making sure that it comes to the forefront and try to educate the people. Don't get too curious with these things. And do the same thing with the um, three people that were lost in Cold River. <coughs> I know I saw a notice for people to keep their drones away from the area for some policy reasons. Yeah. The, the newer drones as well, I've got a DJI, and I've been flying down over our construction site, which is right at the port of the runway. And the pilot and hold the tower, I got clearance with all the proper procedures. And they said, yes, you're 32, like 600 feet. So you took the tax away, and 10 minutes max was over here on the ground. And the first time I got my clearance away down there to start it, I pushed the power lever forward, and my and the drone and actually display came up and said, you're in the no-fly zone. <laughs> Done. Done you do. It's not going to fly. And we had to, we had to actually email and so I sent it up to David to an engineering group in Hong Kong to get that way so I could fly out the field. So, and I, I did ask them, I said, what if I'd been off field and been flying towards the airport? And they said, you get that three or five mile limit, it would give me the same air. If I didn't respond, go to the plane and shut down. So, Neuralist has some pretty neat technology in there for safety around airports. It's frustrating. <laughs> 
<laughs> Apparently, it can be bypassed huh? in some way, somehow. Well, only if you call Hong Kong and send them your driver's license and all your information. First board. It's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Is there anything else that you find is a big concern for the airport with your number one worry with keep shipping at night? Is there anything that you know, is, is up in the street? Uh, I'll speak briefly from you to you and then give it to Bill. But uh, what we've always noticed is that being at the outskirts of town uh, and the low point doesn't just mean your water pipes first um, uh, and, uh, and things of that nature, but, but you really are out uh, kind of out, out of the view of the public eye. And so for us, with all the students that we do that we have out there, and we fly seven days a week, we fly till midnight or one o'clock in the morning, we start flying at five thirty or six in the morning as well. Making sure that we have lighting, that we have regular patrols, that we do these types of things is really important for a university environment because there are a lot of people that that's where they tend to to go to to get away from the city, and yet they can't go any further than that dike road. And so we do see some traffic, uh, and so the type of infrastructure, the developments that are happening with here and everything else, really makes it more of a populous area. And I think that that's going to bring some, uh, you know, some professional attributes that we certainly would, uh, would welcome. So the parking lot, the infrastructure that's happening, and some of these other things, I think, is really going to help with that. We've never really had a, a, a big issue, but it's it's definitely something that uh, you know that we, that we look at as as being an area that, that, that can be uh, you know further further supported. And we do what we can with UVU by sending regular patrols down there nightly, once or twice a night as well from the University, and uh, and that helps with uh, with making sure that we keep a secure environment and, and keep everything safe. So that's a just a little something from UVU. But, I would say it, it, this doesn't impact up directly with the hangar capacity on the field. Uh, it needs to be bolstered with the new taxiway that we were talking about earlier. There's plans for, I think, eight or ten new corporate hangers. But just talking to customers and clients and people around the area, uh, a lot of the small aircraft are moving to Spanish Port because there's just no room on Provo. I think the Provo City would invest in. 30 new T hangers for 172, so they can all be at least before you probably broke ground. There's a yeah. So when you say invest, it's going to cost money. But look at yeah. what's the return on the investment? Do you, do you actually make money on that? So I'm just familiar with like the link that Nebraska set up, and, and yeah, the city built the hangers at their cost. They own them, and I think they lease them for 200 a month. Here's a little more math, right? Yeah. Even our newer ones. I mean, if you do a, yeah, with, with any kind of amortization, there you would definitely be paying that off. I mean, you look at the hangers that are now, like the financials, you'd see that not only are they paid off, but of course, that's that's money, that's one of the revenue streams that the city has. Steve or Trent would have to speak to how much that is, but I guarantee it's profitable. Um, we are dealing with some of that, but we have to deal with the historical situation now. Yeah, and that's we're, it. We're trying to get the mitigation down to, let's say, one of them. Knock down rest because they're just there's just ten buildings. We'll say though we're talking about two different things that are very similar. So the area that you're speaking of, Gary, has to do with uh, making land available so you can get land lease from a potential uh, private builder because it's a little bit larger hangar, and so you would still earn money from as a, from a city perspective. But you'd be you're talking more if you if you did a city built T hangar which means that you would do a row of hangers, uh, much like what we have on the north end, but there's room to do two or three more of those easily. In fact, I think it's on the master plan as well. Then that would be solely owned by the airport. It would, they would all be in unison and uh, you know be designed to your specifications, and that would be always for rent, whereas the other ones would be owner-occupied, paying a long-term lease. But you're right, Gary. That's, that's an area that I think that uh, just going off the of bill's point, those lots were available, not only would you have those six, seven, half a dozen, whatever it might be, corporate lots in the 150 foot range built very quickly, if not immediately, but I think every one of those small building sites would uh, appeal to the to the transient or the local pilot that has a, a private airplane. Is there, are there private companies that actually do that, that work together with the municipal airport, where if a private person wanted to do that on their property, or is that become really tough because of all the restrictions, the FFA and the 
I think you'd have a fight between the ten. I don't think he's a good. It'd the be city pretty wants them to build them and afford at least the whole property out to a private company. All the tea hangers down the line house the city. Then, then the city of long, long term as well. I think it's better for the city to pull control of that. And it makes sense. I just wondered if there's any opportunity. You're talking about private property? A pri no, a private company coming in and actually building. leasing a building and then leasing a they want to do that. But then they have to attach to our airport and it becomes tough. Yeah, there's some minimum standards regulations too uh, for TAC Air and, and the other uh, commercial uh, operators to be able to handle that. But uh, if, you, if you're speaking of a, a private company just to simply build them and then sell them off or something like that, that would be that would be maybe different. And other airports like Spanish Fork, it's kind of the model they take. And they basically said, you know, I want to build a hangar and I'm going to build two more and sell them because I'm in, I'm already, you know, mobilized with the equipment. I can get the steel cheaper, whatever it might be that they're thinking. Um, I, I think, though, Trent, with the lots that are, would be available are, are they're, they're not adjacent to each other and it's just kind of piecemealed out. And of course, once you get into that corporate level, you're talking multi-million dollar infrastructure. And although it might be the same company that builds them, it's all very specific to the specifications of the owner. I think there's a lot of ways you can do it. I mean, whether it's private or, or public, I mean, you talk about return on investment. Well, the fact of the matter is there's just no space available right now for even somebody privately to come in to build something. I mean, you got to have this. The city at one point's got to invest in putting infrastructure in, such as taxiways and whatnot, or private company such as uh, what we're doing right now with Tac Air. You know, we're going to be building a taxiway for the city uh, to be able to put a hangar and build a hangar to help accommodate the huge demand that there is at the airport. Uh, Bill's absolutely right, and it's a great point. Mario's absolutely right with his concerns with uh, security. Uh, at night, uh, the avail availability of law, for law enforcement during commercial flights. Uh, I know that's been uh, it's been great as of recently. There, you know, but I know that is uh, straining the resources of the Provo City Police Department to do that. Uh, but uh, that really is uh, and the fire department, right, Chief? Uh, I think that's appreciate all you doing as well. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, you ask what keeps me up at night, I mean, it, it's what I've already expressed to you, the uh, the number of operations we have in one confined area of the airport. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have had the opportunity to fly out on Allegiant, see the parking situation during a flight, when we have multiple flights on the street side. Um, you know, you always worry about people getting run over. Uh, and then ramp side, you know, uh, the, the possibilities and risks associated with uh, with that are ever increasing. Uh, so far, we've done a great job of, of mitigating those risks and, and having a safe operation. But as we keep in, keep increasing these things and not not building the infrastructure necessary to accommodate growth at the airport, it's just going to get worse. More. We have a public resident that wanted to ask a quick question. And of course, when we put greenhouses up by the airport, they explored for a while the idea of building an air freight facility um, in conjunction with Hughes, the people who have the, the firm company, who they're related to. They told that the city would not um, allow through the fence operation for anything like that. Has a question like that been brought to the airport board that ever been discussed? Yeah, through the fence has. Has the airport board considered that? Uh, the, the through the fence operation has to happen. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of things that, that you have to think about there. Um, there's been talk of that even with what ends up now being Kenny Sand Construction and, and the predecessors there is a helicopter operation, Silver State, and uh, the one prior to that, which was Rocky Mountain helicopters, then sold off and portions of it moved to Colorado. Uh, the whole idea of a through the fence operation to be successful would mean that you actually had an adjacent infrastructure that made sense to be able to get that product or service literally through that fence um, uh, and onto the airport via taxiway or whatever it might be. 
I don't know exactly what they would propose. Am my understanding they propose to be able to ship plants and things that they produce in a separate freight company. So my question would be, why wouldn't they just be on the airport? Why would it be on through the fence when there's plenty of ground to lease? Um, it's supposed to have an adjacent to the airport property. That's what, that's what I would question first and foremost. Because if they wanted to have establish a business, there's space. Well, not really based on the hangars. There could be space as things come up for sale and and uh, and things of that nature and proposals could be made to, to establish a business like that, like Alpine, which is a freight company that operates out of Pro. They do not so much freight as they do overhaul the aircraft that they're obviously on the airport. That's a simple question. One of the reasons would be that if they move on to the airport, they have to lease, lease any land, and if they don't go on to the airport, they would stay on their own land. They don't have to lease anything. So as opposed to, to so you're changing. Good job, Steve. Then I'm in you're talking about the, the extra land they may have that's adjacent, that's not a good Directly house. adjacent, uh, five acres behind the greenhouse, directly adjacent, yeah. and they have the money to put in for infrastructure for taxi rate. They were told to say, what do you consider it? I don't know the, the airport board had heard the proposal. Uh, speaking for uh, the airport board, from my perspective, and I've been on it for, for many years, um, <clears throat> I've not heard that proposal. We obviously have discussed through the like operations. Through the, through the board, I think that uh, is the through the board be willing to invite the courts? I don't see. Uh, I don't have no objection personally. Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. They can go to the any of the board meetings. Mm -hmm. Those are public meetings. The other public meetings, absolutely. Sure. All right. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. This has been extremely uh, informative and um, excited about the things that we've heard. I just have one last comment. When you, the suggestion to invest in tea hangers. Um, if, if the board thinks that that would provide a good return on investment for the city and that we're in a position to actually do that, I'd be interested in, if you'd like to bring some numbers of what that would look like. Is it in the master plan now? It was no, the, the first thing now that it has been is finishing that taxi lane that Pack Air started um, to get corporate anger. I mean, that's that would be a higher. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you talk about return on investment. You're not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you talk about return on investment. In my opinion, you're not going to get a huge return on investment on tea hangers. I mean, I mean, as a city, I mean, I would honestly look at. I think a private company, in my opinion, would be able to do that a lot better. But, well, it's the tens of thousands of dollars that would come in for, for potentially each each uh, larger hanger that you put on the taxiway. But of course, the infrastructure is also offset. It's also more money to do the infrastructure. But when you talk about that, there's other things that come in with it. If you're able to accommodate your corporate businesses that are here, I mean, what else do they do for community development? development? They may actually move their corporate office to Provo or Marion. Uh, Pro, and uh, uh, I think it's Clyde, right? That, that put theirs in Orem. But they came to Provo to put their airplane here because this is where the airport is. And so it does actually help the entire environment. And so you're going to have other companies like that, and I can't speak for them, of course. It's just something I've noticed on my own. But, but what I, but what I can say is that that synergy that we spoke of earlier will, will obviously include that airport environment. People want to be where there's a functional fire department. There's all these other services, and they know it's professional. They can go in and out of there, uh, and, and hopefully take off and land at any given time. That's what they want, and they're, they're willing to pay a little bit more for that. They want to be able to build their headquarters and have something that's very nice. And you already have a corporate road to full. And every one of those corporations and private individuals that have their airplanes there um, are very happy to be there, and they're not going anywhere as far as I'm concerned. But realize that Provo City has some of the, the greatest uh, you know, wealth when it comes to aviation ownership as well, because you have some aircraft out there that are just phenomenal. I mean, to be able to say that you have the type of corporate planes uh, flying in and out of Provo Airport is, is really a pretty good thing. It also means that those people own their business and have their homes in this area and they want to be here. So obviously to invest in that infrastructure, I think is important. I think that that's an opportunity to do the team hangers, absolutely. If there's a prioritization, of course, the corporate um, is, is very important to us because we know that they're, they're chomping at the bit and they just can't get to the land that's already available. Um, they need to be able to get to it. And then the other thing I might throw in is that there's a lack of services big time um, as far as for anything else. You're looking at several hundred employees that are eventually gonna be coming out here to, uh, to work at Duncan. We already have several hundred that work uh, at the airport, I have over 130 myself, and uh, let me tell you where they go to eat lunch, or where they go to uh, to do any uh, of those other types of things. And uh, there's opportunities there, I think, for some other development. 
of support on the west side of Provo City, especially now with the, the west side connector and any other improvements in Provo High. It's going to be interesting. I think it's all going to be, uh, you know, pretty positive in the long run for, for you as a city. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, Bill made a good comment there. I, if there's some of these things that, some of these investments that you think we should be looking at that we that we aren't right now, if you can kind of give us a prioritized list to consider, that would be great. Like I said, with the, with the terminal and more parking <clears throat> and a chance to get other airlines in there, like I said, they had 13 billion saved up. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. We have to